What is up, awesome humans of the world? Welcome to the Bell Vista Studio Show. Today, I'm really excited we got Richard here. And before I get into why I'm excited about Richard sharing his projects, is I just want to like let people know the intent of this show. It is a place for us to pull people that we're recognizing around the world that are doing good training solutions and to be inspired because a lot of the time we work in silos and we work in our own little boxes and it's a good place for us to be curious, to challenge ourselves to do things differently. And when we can see cool stuff, then we can be inspired to do better ourselves as practitioners and bring that to our learners and make the world a better place. So that's the intent of the Bell Vista Studio Show. And Richard, why I'm super excited to have you here is because we're really big on human-centered design. And through the work that I see you sharing on LinkedIn, you do a lot of like a design thinking approach. So that really resonates, but you also bring it with a storytelling approach and the neuroscience, so that motivation, why piece to change behavior. And I think that's huge, like in terms of, it's not just creating a story for the sake of stories. It's like, how do we get someone to do something differently after what it is that you've created? So yeah, this is your space now. I will hand over to you to kind of lead us, but let me know what was the, you've got a project that you're gonna share. What was the problem yeah. you were trying to solve for your client? So I, I mean, process. just getting back into the the human centered design piece and the the motivation theory, I think a lot of people underestimate the influence that emotions have on learning. So if you're just presenting information, you're not really conveying anything that that people can latch onto or or glean. Partly because the way the brain is integrated, emotions are an essential part of that. There are a lot of suggestions and theories that we are emotional beings that respond based on those emotions and then kind of um, rationally justify our actions as some, as some kind of afterthought. And a lot of the work we're doing is to try to get people in, in order to open them up to be receptive to, to that new information and to nudge these behaviors, we have to give them some kind of emotional investment. But it's not just to say that I'm making people sad or angry or anything like that. It's, it's really that you're also engaging their curiosity. You're giving them an incentive to participate in how it applies from their own lens or their own perspective. So, you know, it's it's like you want your kids to grow up and to, to make their own good choices, their own positive choices. They don't have to do it just the way that you want it done. It's as long as they're also content that they find happiness within what they're doing, that's success. And I think we're taking the same approach to learners is that it's not that they're stupid or that they're lazy or any of the stuff that kind of is an easy um, write-off of, of why training is ineffective. It's actually more that, we're not giving them the what's in it for me. And that's a huge part of this. And one of the ways I found to do that, to engage story or to engage emotion and to engage a sense of what's in it for me is to tell stories because we naturally want to close the loop or figure out what is the answer, what happens, why, why is the scene unfolding the way it is and what does it mean as it pertains to my life. Movies teach us all sorts of stuff about our life. And that's the thing that I, you know, I get the biggest benefit out of is that really good movies taught me, they have taught me something about the world I wasn't prepared to see. And, and that's really a powerful tool. So I want to tap into that. The most- that's freaking cool. Yeah, I really like it. Um, and the most recent project uh, I was working on was for a food safety training. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit about it. It's, it's uh, I'm going to be very limited in terms of what I can show you, but I'll give you kind of an overview of, of what this is. Um, so I'm going to just quickly share this, and then I'd like to basically kind of debrief and talk about what what went into this and why this is important. So, okay. um, before you is, get into this one, can I just ask you, in terms of emotions, have you noticed particular emotions to pull on are more impactful to change behavior than others? It depends. There are different theories around this. So if you want people to remember certain things. Um, there is a study about how you can, if you show something really traumatic or uh, upsetting prior to that, that, that people have an Im improved I imprint of what that memory is. It's, <laughs> but it's like the advice isn't to go and traumatize your workforce in order for them to remember stuff. And it's selective. It just, it kind of depends. So I would say um, if I'm going to speak 
to what I think is more of the dangers of this neurohacking, biohacking kind of sensibility, I would say anger is probably the most um, responsive for sharing content, for example, or, or wow. getting involved without really getting involved, which is what Facebook has kind of um, really taken advantage of. The problem is, is, and they're even dialing this back when they're trying to remove political content and political discourse, because even though this has garnered them a lot of money, it's becoming so destructive that people are leaving the platform. So again, it, it's to a point. Um, I think there's a there's a really great quote, and I can't totally remember the person who said it. Um, uh, it's it totally I'm like right there with it. Um, I'll come back to me. But basically, the idea that like we should never accept that um, technology be a, 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 a aspect integral aspect to our world. That really, as tech, as technology grows, it it's interlinked with the societal influences governmental influences, economic influences, and all these things. It's a product of that time and it shifts. So it shouldn't just be kind of taken as a de facto standard. Does that, that's a little bit tangential, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Mm, no, I see it totally. And I can see, you know, if you think about LinkedIn and the posts that get the most like um, comments or likes tend to be those ones that aggravate or pull yeah. out a frustration in someone, which kind of taps into that anger. And then you're just like, yeah, it's like a venting thing. Uh, yeah. I'm curious how you do that in learning where you can get someone into a state of anger, but then not have them like going afterwards and ruining the workplace and being an right. asshole. <laughs> well, and I don't, I don't particularly activate anger a whole lot in the training films. A lot of it is ideal. If it's with a global organization, I will focus on things that are more humanitarian, which you'll mm -hmm. see in this kind of intro um, when I play it. But uh, the, the main thing is the first part of my work is to do a guided clarity session, which is a product that we sell. It's a stakeholder meeting. So we kind of get a, a sense of what are the goals and the bright spots that exist in the organization? Where are there some obstacles in organizational development? And once I have all that information, I can say, oh, cool. I understand more about what your company needs and what your learners want. And I can reconcile what the stakeholder wants to what the learner wants. And that's a, that's a skill that has taken years to develop. But that gives me a lot of information for what kind of emotions I activate, you know, what are the restrictions? So an example I give people is, you know, if you're talking to giving a, a training about sales training or something, and you want to activate that pride aspect of people, you might talk about characters who are trying to be celebrated, like, like that's their main goal, or they want respect. Not every culture responds to that. They're not all trying to get ahead. So you have to be very sensitive to the nuances of the, the cultural influences of your audience. That's not something that's an easy answer, but if you start asking questions about these people and, and, and your audience, your learners, what do they want? What's in it for them? You can start to get a, a, a clearer picture of how to serve them or what story would like resonate with them. It's all about connection. That's, that's the piece where I feel, I feel very hesitant to talk about technology as like, a, you know, statistically it's better if we use anger, blah, 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 because really it's not about getting them to act out it's about it's about communicating value and connection and, and having a deeper connection to them being celebrating more of the human things that make us human love it so in that context um i did a, a deep dive of this organization and one of the things that was problematic was they were trying to change their safety protocol they had a whole new process they brought in this new kind of ip and they were very committed to becoming the gold standard for food safety. They had a couple recalls in the past. They didn't want to repeat these things. And one of the things that was problematic is that as they kept harping on this message, you start to get a bit numb to it. So the learners would just be like, well, yeah, I, I know I'm supposed to be paying attention to safety, right? I know I'm supposed to care about what goes into the food, but it, they didn't have, a, 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 they were losing the emotional connection to it that got them to think about it every single day, right? Like it's, it, it needed to be some kind of meditation. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we did is I went through their um, current framework, their current learning materials. They had a bunch of different PowerPoint decks and all these things. And I just kind of like, you know, in the matrix, just, you know, stabbed this 
this uh, cable in the back of my head and suck in all that information. <laughs> and I go through and say, all right, well, what are some trends that are unspoken or frameworks that currently exist? And I found that they had this four part framework that was to own it, to see it, solve it and do it, right? So first the person needs to own responsibility or sorry, the first it was to see it, see it. I need to recognize that there's a problem. I need to own and be accountable to it. I need to solve the problem or come up with a solution. And then I need to implement that solution. I found that that four part framework was very similar to other four part frameworks that I've been using um, that I would recommend to them. And even so, I went so far as to create a story that was based in four acts or so each module consists of an act and it's, it's got this narrative that runs through it. And by the end of that narrative, the main character sees it, the main character owns it, the main character solves it, the main character uh, does it. And so basically you as the viewer are going through this process, you're also watching the, the woman who's the main character of this film, she's going through this process. So you're, you're getting like this, this interesting synergy between the two people where you are basically an echo of the main character. Now, this is not always something that I recommend people do, but I, I think what you're trying to do in, in building a, a learning experience is to think about what it's like to be the person going through it. What would be really fun? For me, I'm like, this is great because I get to be in the driver's seat. The other thing I'll mention um, is that we included a virtual reality aspect within these modules so that as the narrative breaks, we then um, cut to a, a, a VR room and they can poke around for clues as though they're the woman trying to solve this mystery. Um, I'm gonna play the opening of this, this film. It's about two minutes and then I'm gonna stop it and I'll, I'll continue on there, but I think it's worth showing the beginning of it. This is, this is the part where I usually wake up. All right. The question is, <laughs> does this look like a training film for food safety? No way. Um, I just want to pause before you get into this and get people to reflect on the audio and visuals and what was going through their mind and how they were feeling in response to that as an opening of a training, like as a practitioner watching this, reflect on that. Because what Richard said earlier was, you got to empathize and think about what you would be feeling and thinking as a learner. And I think that's a great, just small snippet and opportunity for you to empathize and put yourself as a learner and then think about what can you take from that inspiration to apply to your projects? But back to you, I'm like, ooh. It's good. Well, and I think part of the, what's interesting to me is when we build our content, a lot of what I'm looking for is people to physically kind of lean in 
And that's an aspect of it where you're like, I'm not totally sure what I'm watching, but I'm not confused. I just, I don't know what, what's happening. And I want to know, I'm curious about it, which I think is a really important element. Obviously this is a, this is pretty heavy stuff. And you know, the, the premise of this story is that this woman's daughter dies as a result of a food related illness. Um, she's dealing with this trauma. Clearly you find out this is a dream and the next scene is her like in a therapy office talking about it. And despite the advice of her husband and, and, you know, to, to not go back to work because she works in food, she decides to anyway, it's, it's a way for her to deal with her grief in the process and to find meaning in her life. But the day she gets back, she gets a call from this person who claims to know the, the company responsible for the, her daughter's death. And, she, and he says that they are trying to cover it up. They are actively trying to hide what they did. So immediately now, this is a way for her to process that trauma, process that grief. And this is not an uncommon story. Uh, I think that's the thing is you have to obviously manage the stuff with sensitivity. And there are a number of people that I'm like even finding as I start to get into the world of food safety that have had this experience that they've, they've lost a child as a result of this. And there's all this, these conflicting emotions. So it wasn't just like shock value. There's actually something like I spent a lot of time really thinking about who this woman is and what she wants and what she needs. And those are very different things. Like what she wants from what she needs are, are two completely different things. And that's the essence of storytelling is to try to like create that, that dichotomy or create that tension. So I spent a lot of time thinking about like what would resonate with this organization and then building that into the modality. So the, the last thing I'll just very quickly share is that at the end of this, at the end of these, um, the sequence, I'm gonna turn the sound off, um, is th so they get to the end of a, so it, she gets a phone call, I mentioned that. So she's playing, um, uh, she's got like photos of, of the guy responsible and we've got this kind of like thriller noir thing going. Um, we then break into this uh, VR space. So the, the narrative ends and now we're in the room looking around at the assets that she had. So it just kind of auto loads. And so, you know, we're allowed to kind of pick stuff up and we can kind of look at like a press release for this company. And so it gives you some instructions on what to do. You can go around here. Um, you can look at and watch videos of, of stuff to kind of like get a better sense of what's happening. You want to examine these things. Um, once you're done with this, um, there are a couple of clues that they have to find. Um, there's an FDA warning letter. It's not technically FDA. Um, the phone rings. You can't hear it now, but, but it actually picks up. And then when you press on it, it resumes the narrative and she hears, you know, the rest of the story. So we, we really wanted to create this dramatic sense um, and, and, and this participation from the main, from, from the viewer. That's, that's why it's, it was designed this way. It wasn't just to say, well, VR would be cool. It's super simple to do this kind of photo stitching stuff with hotspots, but people don't utilize this. We get so caught up in the novelty of um, technology that it's like, it's not about the, the tech, it's about what the tech does and what the tech enables. Yeah, so, I love that. Awesome. What was the, um, you, I felt like you had another question that was that daisy chained from the reflection about the beginning of the, of the motivation model. Is there anything else that you'd like me to cover on that front? Um, I think making the link, well, I think just kind of understanding your process in terms of you go and speak to people to find out what's important to them. That connection was the key word. What are they going to connect with? And then when you get that data, like people tell you about what I care about in terms of food safety, you had people that are fatigued. It's a compliance topic. Mm -hmm. How do you then go from that to this is my script? This is the story I'm going to tell. <laughs> Magic? Um, peyote? I don't know. I mean, I, I guess it depends. Um, no, no, but really, I, I'm very comfortable with the design process. This is just something I've built for myself. I have my own kind of proprietary approach that I use. And the main thing, I actually built a, a storytelling course that, that runs through this. And I'll, I'll give you a kind of a brief overview of it, but I'd recommend people actually buy it if you just go to hmm. story.sage.academy. Um, we'll put the link in the description, everyone, to that. Yeah. I, I, so the, the main reason I create it is because the problem that you're describing is something that learning designers struggle with a lot. Storytelling is a circuitous 
circular process, iterative process, you trial and error over and over, like, why is it this woman and not like a 57 year old man or a 15 year old boy? Like, like what, what choices went into making this scenario the way it is? And I've got like, their names mean something like all this stuff is like the main character, the main antagonist is an anagram of, um, of Stuart Parnell, who is the president of the Peanut Corporation of America. And so like little things like that, like little Easter eggs I'll put in there, even though no one needs to know about it. It's funny that it's actually like another name. Um, but if you know that story, then it's like a little bit of a benefit. The, the way that I'm, I'm translating this, this process of taking this, this circular process, you're trying to make it linear because the way you write it or tell it is linear, even if the events are, are nonlinear, even if they happen out of order. So I found a way to, to do that. One of the first steps that's required for you to translate a learning objective or a behavior goal is to convert that language of the learning objective or behavior goal into what's known as a core premise. So a core premise is what is what we call the moral of the story. It's what Sage Media refers to as the moral of the story. Every story teaches you something. It has an underlying like pithy takeaway. Think of Aesop's fables, right? They all end and you, know, you hear the story about the fox and the grapes and you know what that story is about. Mm -hmm. And so he, he summarizes it for you in case you missed the point in the story. But, uh, but your job as a learning designer who's creating a story is to take that hit the sentence and then hide that in the story. But before you can do that, you have to make sure that your learning objective sounds like that aphorism or sounds like that core premise. So I, I teach you how to go through the process of it. It's a lot more involved than what I can share here, but um, that's the key. Once you have that, then you can find stories. You don't even have to create them. You can just find things. You know, example I give people often is I say, you know, if you're trying to, to, to prove to somebody that they shouldn't take candy from strangers, well, then you need to have a story that supports that. And if I'm telling you a story that's, that doesn't seem related, it's frustrating for the learner. So once I get all the data from the stakeholders and say, okay, what, what is it that you really want to prove to them? What's the core message that if they walked away with nothing else, what is that? What would that be? And, and they gave me, they, they gave me a summary of what they wanted. And I built that into the story because I said, well, what's the best way to prove this and I, I i i would have to go into too much about the backstory of the story because when you get to the end the plot twist at the very very end is like it's gutting um <laughs> it's, you know because it's something where you're like i didn't realize like the the implications of what this story world allowed for me and that mm -hmm. was very exciting as a storyteller so part of it is I, i'm taking the the stakeholder wants along with what the learners want and, and, and I'm designing like, who is the best representation of this character arc? So once you have that premise, you have this, the story objective and, and you've translated it from the learning objective and it sounds like it could be a story, you then just determine what the ending is gonna be. Is it a sad ending or is it a happy ending? Does the character learn the lesson or do they fail to learn the lesson? And you just engineer backwards. It's really quite simple. And I think that a lot of learning designers get overwhelmed with storytelling because there are so many possibilities. They're like, I, I could tell all sorts of stuff. It could be a Western. It could be a, you know, it could be something I've seen on TV already. I could just do another rehashing of it. Mm -hmm. The way to get around that is to have a systematic process that gives you only the best option. When you think of who the best character is to prove that you should not take candy from strangers, it's going to come up for you of what the only person is that can, that can support that. You might have other people floating around, but we asked you a series of questions to be like, no, this is the, this is the person. This main character, Lauren, is the best character for this, this story. You know, there's this mother losing a child, this career-driven person who has a connection to this industry was the best representation. Normally we take our stories out of the environment that they exist in. You know, I don't want it in a food manufacturing plant. In this case, it was essential because food can be nourishing or poisoning. And we wanted that theme throughout the story. So there's all these links that you can start to make when you start asking yourself the question of, if I'm a learner, what has the most impact to me? Yeah. And then the rest of it's like, it's systematic. I, I can go through it if you want, but it's like the, it's the entire story design process, which I, I think you just have a better time going through the course. <laughs> yeah. It's cool. It reminds me of what we kind of share and you've just said it in a different way, but I want to make the link for people that follow our content is you're always asking yourself, what is the intent of this? And that's what yeah. you're saying. I can't remember the language that you use, but it's like, what is the intent? And then 
that everything that you put in needs to align to that. Otherwise, it doesn't have a place in the story right. that you're telling. And what right. you're describing there is what's the end result? Reverse engineer. And I describe it as close the gap. Where are you currently at? Where do you need to be? And close the gap. Um, so that's really cool. What I'm curious about is, do you find that um, the people that come to you, your clients, come to you because they want this kind of solution or they want a compliance course and you're trying to say, hey, let's do it this way? So most of the clients I deal with are people that have problems that no one else wants to deal with or can't deal with. Okay. Uh, we beat out uh, McKinsey for this project, which I'm actually really proud of because they're, I mean, I, I admire them a lot, but I'm also like really happy that I can have a niche that doesn't, you know, I, I can, I can, I can provide value uh, where they cannot. It, it, yeah. it means I belong in some kind of market and as a business owner, that's really empowering. Yeah. Um, just because a lot of this stuff was more soft skills based or culture improvement, human capital development focused doesn't necessarily mean that it, I can't do this with compliance. With compliance, it's the same thing. So I ask people this question all the time in the States, anti-harassment training is the bane of everyone's existence. And I will often ask, um, can you imagine sexual harassment prevention training that people would knock down the door to, to watch, that they would knock down the door to consume? Most people can't. And the reason that they can is because compliance is done thinking of how do I protect the company which is fine, you have to do that. That's the point of compliance training in that context. But you don't have to stop there. You can say, well, what? All, what that's the stakeholder thing. What do the stakeholders want? We wanna protect the company. Gotcha. That's not gonna make compelling content. Mm. What would make compelling content that would also protect the company? That's easy. I mean, it's, 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 I'm saying it's easy, like it requires an ideation process, but I know where I'm going there because I can now think about like, well, what are some of the benefits of taking anti-harassment training? You know, that you, you have more connection to your team. You can express yourself more freely. You don't have to worry about being like, you know, whatever like people's concerns are, whether they're rational or not, they have them and you need to know what those are. That, just to back up on the clarify session, when we're interviewing a lot of these stakeholders and, and participants, they're not telling us overtly, this is what they want or this is what they need. They're not gonna say, I'm afraid. But you have to infer a lot by really listening to what is between the lines and, and asking questions. And this is just a process of, you know, keep practicing, practice interviewing people. Um, so you can see like, are they really telling me the truth? And they, I know they said they're not afraid of this at all, but they kept bringing it up, you know, <laughs> it's something there. So you got to have the real, real curiosity and passion for people. Yeah. And I think what the benefit of what you're sharing there, like people can be turned off by compliance and that it always has to be boring and what I love about what you're sharing the process that you've been sharing so far is compliance doesn't need to be that and by co-creating which is what you're describing that curiosity asking questions seeking to understand this clarity um, and guided session that you do the benefit for your stakeholders for them to appreciate this kind of solution for a compliance thing is that they're bought in from the very beginning and they're co-creating with you as a learning designer and therefore they are less likely to say no or to be like what are you presenting to me that's never going to fly because they've been there part of the journey the whole way and through that co-creation allows you as a learning designer to come up with solutions like this that actually do change behavior so i think that's really inspirational for the industry to see what you've just shown today it's awesome i mean and, and the thing is in the meetings like i make sure to really be very clear about the the problems i'm addressing like the stakeholders have absolutely believable, realistic, viable, like understandable concerns. And so for me to come in and just be like, I think it should be this story and it's all this crazy stuff. Of course, they're going to be like, no. But if I'm like, I really heard what the problem was and it sounds like it's this. What do you think about this addressing that? And it, it often they'll be like, yeah, like I, I see where you're going there. And, and you know, I guess we, we do have to shake it up. I mean, I, I think that the, the fear of not of you know getting your hopes dashed of having an idea is is maybe part of it and that just you know don't worry like it's gonna it's is good practice and you need to flex and you need to go extreme i mean you can always dial it back but i think that this speaks to another issue which i see as problematic for a lot of developers is that they don't put themselves in the project 
So this means something to me. This the the ending of this movie bothers me a lot. Like it, it's it's something that speaks to me as I'm a single dad and I think about like you know losing my son and that's like it's horrifying and and it's something that like it bothered me for weeks thinking about this process and so I you know I put me I put myself into it I put my the stuff that's important to me into it and so I, I feel like there's a better connection to the people I'm talking to they watch the movie and they kind of understand me a bit more yeah because you're a human and you're designing for humans yeah and exactly. sometimes we forget that we think that's we do <laughs> people out there <laughs> yeah yeah um did you so they look like she looks like a paid actor or something like that so you had probably a professional well you're a videographer aren't you so you probably did the filming and did you edit and do all that stuff yourself yeah so that uh, we do all of this stuff internally and we we build content for a variety of different scales so we're doing yeah. case study videos that are more like what a videographer would do and we're doing like full sag productions this was a, this was a sag after a production so there was probably a lot more involved but we're still people think that this is like that must be expensive and i'm like mm. it's not that expensive um you know I, I think that the rule of thumb for corporate videography is about five to seven thousand us dollars uh, per finished minute um, which is a pretty good estimate but there's also this host of other things that we're doing this was multiple languages this was developed you know in in a scorm compliant uh product um and we also have all these other interactive pieces that kind of um you know integrate with it how to play on their server so we have a bunch of technical assistance we really try to make this streamlined my my goal is really to transform how learning is done and i don't want that to be um, held back because of some seemingly like minuscule obstacle like oh you know our browser doesn't support html5 okay who cares like i'll figure it out you know like whatever the problem is we do that stuff up front so that whatever the the experience is it's seamless i mean what sucks now is I, the minute this started lagging i was like ah oh, cognitive load i'm thinking about like it breaking the experience mm -hmm. and i don't want that for my viewers when we deliver the product so what you're seeing now is like a um like a temporary portal that i'm having but the videos are like not optimized for it um especially through zoom so but those things matter aesthetics matter mm -hmm. The experience matters. Do you want to watch a buggy show on Netflix? If it kept pausing every five minutes, are you are you pissed about it? So like, I think yeah. that's something that uh, we have to consider. Like, I think you've really hit on the head. It's like, it's nothing more than just imagine yourself going through that driver's seat and what that experience is like for you. What would be the coolest thing you could do yeah. that would make your learners as excited and make you as excited as you want your learners to be? Yeah. And I think that's important. Look, good instructional design can be presented in any output, right? Mm -hmm. And what we, you can see that you've got good instructional design going there. And I just want to, you've got like the kind of, you say the gold star output, which it's paid actors, it's professionally shot and it's produced the way it is, but all it's still possible to scale it back and still achieve the same output. And just to give an example, it would be use photographs. Mm -hmm. of that scene you can put music in there you can put sound effects you can have audio voiceover and recreate a, a scene or an environment that represents what you've done in through video but also the essence of the storyboard so that kind of stuff is still possible and even your vr room although that's shot probably on a 360 camera the same thing is possible through just a shutterstock image that is put on screen and it's a click and reveal. So I just want people to not get scared about the solution that you're presenting because what's really key about Richard's behavior change approach is that he's empathizing with the end user. He's seeking to understand the true problem that he needs to solve for his client. And that comes in the instructional design side of things. And when you get that right, you use the rest of the budget or what is within the technology capabilities or within your team's capabilities to produce an output that is high, medium or low. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, I mean, I'm an artist and I think you guys as instructional designers are artists and it's okay to embrace that and be like, this is my creative process um, and not be intimidated by it. I mean, yeah, the VR stuff's not a barrier. Like it really isn't a barrier. And I, story is the, is the big issue. That, that's the thing where I feel people are most overwhelmed, which is why we built this solution because no one's doing it. If you want to learn how to tell stories, you got to go buy all these books about screenwriting and it becomes overwhelming because everyone has their own approach. Mm -hmm. You know, if you read Save the Cat, you've got the beat board. If you read, 
you know, um, Sid Field stuff on, on screenwriting. It's like, he's got his three act structure that you got to follow. You read Robert McKee. He's got a whole other thing and none of them really fit. Like they're great, but they, they, they're reverse engineered for films that were written. They don't teach you how to write them in real time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I need something that's going to help me without needing to know anything about the background, go from start to finish. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to mention too, that um, there was another aspect you mentioned in terms of the like I was even thinking about like sock puppets, like it doesn't matter. Oh, well, the the stills. Um, I don't know if you ever if you've ever seen La Jate by Chris Marker. Yeah. One of my favorite science uh, fiction films. It's only like half an hour long. They remade it into 12 Monkeys. Uh, ah, with Bruce yeah, and Brad I do Pitt. know that one. Um, it's all still photos, except for this one scene when he falls in love with a woman, he goes back in time, he falls in love with this woman. And when he wakes up next to her, they do this blurring of the images until it becomes motion picture and her eyes open in 24 frames. And it's this, it's so beautiful. It's the only film shot in the entire movie. The rest of it is pictures. And it's so powerful. Like it's a, I mean, the movie's amazing. You can find it on YouTube, but mm. um, that kind of thing is like, it's, you're being creative. You're like, how can I, how can I make this interesting with what I've got? Like, yeah, that's the fun part. So yeah. um, are there any shows, movies, anything in the world that has done something creatively from a, uh, a media output perspective or storytelling perspective that you're like, oh, I want to experiment with that on a future project. I mean, not, not that I would use or experiment okay. necessarily. I mean, the Chris Marker thing is probably the closest to it, but I, I mean, the stuff that I'm really impressed by or moved by like uh, Jean-Luc Godard is still making movies and he's like in his eighties and they are, they're, they're a lot like they're, I think they're brilliant. They are painful, physically painful to watch. He um, took him years to develop it, but he did a 3D movie mm -hmm. and he would have like a man and a woman in, in separate channels and he would have them together when they're being romantic and he would physically pull the channels apart. So you have like migraines from the leakage or that's what they call it when like your, your brain can't perceive the distance. So you're having like this physically painful sensation of these people being um, separated mm. and you you have this visceral experience of the separation anxiety of the pain of it I'm like this I mean he's on a, another level the dude's way out there but um, <laughs> I love that kind of stuff um, I, I, I love all kinds of movies I think I think cinema is fantastic so I watch a lot of out there stuff um, I, recently I should say pre pre-covid they had a screening of uh, Satan Tango okay which is the uh, a, a Bellatar film, seven and a half hours, and they only gave you two 20 minute breaks. And it was one of the best movie going experiences I've ever had. Wow. It was, it was like, I was entertained the entire time. There was never a point where I was like, this is boring. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I, I get a lot of inspiration from like little segments of that. Yeah. Uh, I watch a lot of Iranian cinema and there's always just these really beautiful renditions of how people interact that I think translate. The thing I will say with, with watching these movies and why it's important is when you consume content from a country different from yours, your physical perception changes. You actually, if you're from a more individualist nation, you tend to focus on foreground elements. Um, when, if you are from a collectivist nation uh, or, ha or a nation that has values that are more collectivist in, in nature, uh, you tend to notice background elements more. So like there's activity in the brain that physically shifts where you're actually tree training your eye and how to see. And mm -hmm. I think that's really powerful because you borrow things that you wouldn't think about. Um, example I give is there was a, a Satyajit Rai film. Um, he was a, a prominent Indian filmmaker in the fifties and, and, and above. And he made this movie where like this guy shows up at this wedding and this woman gets left at the altar and he just steps in and marries her. And, and he was talking about how like this showed at Khan, I think, or something like that. And he was like, people didn't understand the, the superstition of being left at the altar and why it was important for him to do that. They just thought it was weird. They still bought it, but he was like, I didn't consider the, the cultural um, intelligence or the cultural perspective of my audience. And mm -hmm. so I'm, I, I kind of missed the, po the, the point. I, I, I failed in that way. Mm -hmm. And I, I always think about that story because I'm like, what am I doing that's going to be problematic for the, the target audience. And I've seen this in, I've heard clients talk to me about this. Like, you know, they have a Japanese focus or they have, you know, a United Arab Emirates focus. And, and they're like, 
you know, something as simple that we take for granted every day might, might be really egregious or borderline offensive. And you're like, I don't see how, because you're not there. You're not, you're not mm. really swimming in that. So that's one other caution I'd say, um, which is why it's important to stick to the more humanitarian things. Everyone knows what it's like to be loved. Everyone knows what it's like to like, you know, um, you know, feel shame. Like we have these experiences that are, are, are somewhat universal. Wow. Oh, this is really <laughs> interesting. No, it's so interesting. I think one thing I'd just like to get people to reflect on is when you were talking about the movies, you, your emotion was really evident, you know, like, I love this particular filmmaker. And then you talked about the emotion of like, how it made you feel uncomfortable, your body language was changing as you were sharing those examples. And I yeah. just like to get people to reflect for themselves when they're watching things, how are you feeling? How is that grinding with you or like coming from a place of love where you're like leaning in um, and they're the things they're the triggers for yourself that you need to think about how can I apply this to the solution that I'm creating if it's having this impact on me may it have impact on others and then the second part of that is validating it because just because it has an impact on you doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to touch others in the same way but I think it might be a starting point to help you tell better stories yeah and just keep it simple you know like it really doesn't have to be very advanced and that way you don't get overwhelmed it's simply you know a man or a woman does something to get a thing that's the core of it is like and how do you create barriers you know i want to get to la so i get in the car and the car doesn't start it's like oh god okay so i check the battery battery fix the battery start driving along and i hit a bump and it blows out my tire it's like oh, yeah. great you know i pulled over I try to get it replaced, but nothing's open. It's a Sunday. And so I got to wait the next day. A bus drives by, it gives me a new opportunity. Like you're just constantly throwing stuff at people, at these characters to make their lives difficult. The, the, the difference and the, the reason why I'm like adamant about the way I approach storytelling from a training perspective, when I train people about this and, and have these online courses for it, is that it's got to be related to the character flaw. So if, you're, if someone is like very prideful, Pride might be a really beneficial thing in certain lines of work, but if you're trying to tell a cautionary a, a cautionary tale about being prideful, you have to make the, the reasons that these obstacles exist is because of this person's pride. And the only way for them to kind of overcome this is when they learn the lesson of not being so prideful. Mm. And, and, and you have to do this. There's obviously a lot of grace that's involved in this process, so it doesn't come off preachy. But this, ha this is all the time. I see this in, in stories everywhere. And that's, that's the real trick. The issue that I find, and this is Hollywood filmmakers as well, it's not just learning designers, is that they don't want to define what the key takeaway is because they somehow feel like it limits their possibilities. And, I, and, and my argument is you want to because the way you render it, the way you demonstrate that mm -hmm. is where the unique voice comes in. So like when you're dealing with worrying about what, what is cliche, cliche is simply just a familiar taxonomy or a familiar... Um, metaphor that's been overused to the point where it becomes conventional. Like you just know, like the abusive dad, like has a wife beater on and, and he's wearing boxer shorts and he's drinking at three o'clock in the afternoon and he's mm -hmm. got a stain on the shirt. Like all those things are stereotypes. You can find really inventive ways. And I think about one of the most accurate depictions of domestic violence was Marta, um, the Reiner Verna Fassbinder film. Super articulate, educated, clean cut war suit, this very attractive man, very, very like successful. And there was no violence in that movie. And it was terrifying. Like it was one of these movies where I'm like, I've never seen this done as accurately as this guy is depicting it. And it's a phenomenal film mm -hmm. um, from the seventies. And it's like those kinds of things where he, he was like, how can I take this and, and look at it from a different lens? How can I reinvent this? So people are surprised by it. How can you like create those little Easter eggs? So in, in, in what this is speaking to, and the reason this is seemingly tangential is that what I'm suggesting is that you leave things for your learners to discover on their own. And how you do that is to subvert their expectations. This is super important because we want to hit them over the head with the knowledge and we don't believe that they're gonna put two and two together, but they do. All you gotta do is speak to yourself in terms of actions and images. What do you see? What, is, what happens in your story? You just tell those things in order and the brain connects the dots. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I, you know, tell you that, that 
I was at the supermarket. There was a weird guy like looking at me and my daughter. Um, I, you know, she's pouting. I go, I go to put her down while I'm loading stuff up. And then I turn around and she's gone. And so is the weird guy. You would naturally assume that like he takes, the, he took my daughter, my fictional daughter. Um, and so I think that, that that's what you're, you're, you're trying to do is to say like, I want to give people that conclusion. The, the challenge, and this is more of an advanced technique, is sometimes they assume things that you didn't want them to assume. So the story of that is like, you know, if I, if I if describe it, like it's because I didn't get my daughter this cereal that she wanted, the brain naturally says, oh, it's because you didn't get her the cereal that she got kidnapped. Mm -hmm. well, that's not necessarily causal, or accurate, <laughs> but you have to be careful when you're building your story so that people don't subconsciously do that. And the learner will not tell you that that's their interpretation, but they will be confused. And, and I've gotten... Um, I, I've done a lot of work over the years and, and to basically have Sage Media create those unintentional links and know what they're going to do. That like, I know that the assumption they're gonna make is what I want them to make because I'm leading them slightly astray. And then I'll come back around and be like, I thought that this happened. <laughs> and then, then you, get, you get that subverting expectation, but without them feeling betrayed or that you're somehow like, you know, pulling one of these NCIS things where it's like, you know, it's the neighbor who called in the, the <laughs> opening scene and we only talked to him for five minutes, but like he was the killer all along. You're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna make sure that they're linked causally. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. This is, wow. I'm like, it's very cool. I think there's a lot going on, but there's also not, if that makes sense. And I just want to yes. kind of summarize <laughs> a yeah, couple please, of the things for people. <laughs> um, can be overwhelming it's, for a lot of people. Oh, I feel like so, I don't know, compelled to go create now. Um, good. <laughs> so thank you for inspiring me. Some of the things that I just think are kind of the core essence of what you've shared is, and not in any particular order, you're simplifying the complex. So you're talking about all these stories and even the examples that you're telling are like going down all these pathways and you're painting this emotional stuff, but really what you're doing is they're just distractions. And if we think when we're writing our scripts or trying to figure out our stories, there is a framework or there is a, an A to B and everything is actually linked to that. The rest is just, I guess, fluff. In yours, you had the, your client example, it was the see, own, solve, do. That was a framework, but your whole story is built around that. Um, there was another example that you had in terms of the where we spoke about what is my intent and linking everything back to that that reverse engineering process that you talked about so number one takeaway simplify the complex and there's a framework to do that or get them from a to b yeah i'd like to show you something real quick here yeah. um so this is what they call a beat board and a beat board is basically like a device that screenwriters use to um lay out each scene so okay. what I'm doing here is I'm saying like, these are the acts, right? So each module I said it has an act. So again, learner will echo Lauren's ability to see food safety as an integrated system, starting from the top management to the plant floor. That's the first thing. So I've got all these, these scenes that happen and each scene moves this character closer to or further from her most important goal. Mm -hmm. So she's got the, the minus right here denotes that, the plus denotes that she's moving toward it. The color represents the character arc. So I've got all of these character lines, these storylines that I'm running. Like I want to say the ambition leads to ruin. I want, you know, that her antagonist is a, an echo or a doppelganger of her. He also leads to ruin, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, we have these other pieces about complacence leading to disaster, transparency leading to trust, humility leading to truth, duplicity leading to ruin. Like there are all these character types and I can quickly spot them as I'm building this grid out. So I can be like, cool. So here's this other side character's trajectory. It's not just, you know, A to B. I'm trying to in, I'm trying to have this, well, back at the farm, this is happening. And you yeah. want to come back and constantly give them. So right at the peak where she goes back to work and you're like, what's going to happen? We shift narratives. So, so right here, when she finally goes back to work, we need like something new to, to change. And we, we catapult ourselves into the next character arc. So I think this is a this is way more above and beyond what what 
I think a lot of learning design ne designers need to do. But for me, it was like, I'm, I'm building a solution to a very complex problem. In the context of a compliance training, it's not just, you know, um, sell better or don't gossip in the break room. Like you need something that's, that's a bit more. And, you know, and when we're talking about being authentic and giving people a piece of yourself in your training, it's also teaching them something that they didn't really know. I mean, mm. if you think of anti-harassment training, mo the biggest problem with it is people are like, yeah, I get it. Like, don't be a pervert. Like, and I don't need to take this for an hour, but yeah. if you teach them new things, they're like, okay, like I, I'm into that. I'm into to learning new stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. And I think you just perfectly demonstrated simplifying the complex because you said earlier, am I looking for good outcome or bad outcome? And how does that play out? And you've count, helped yourself. You've got like a little process in place where you're using the pluses, you're using the minus, we're moving them away from this, we're moving them to something else. Now we're coming back. And I love that you have that little accountability. I saw page goal. And I think that's really cool because, and that's really important as a learning designer to hold yourself accountable to meet the right intent, to make sure you're meeting that learning objective. So that, yeah. thanks for sharing that. Awesome. Um, the other thing is the actions and images. And I feel like that is really cool. Cause even when you gave that, you're in the supermarket with your fictional daughter, I'm imagining those visuals helped me. And even if I like think through it in my head and it's just visuals only and no audio yet, I can get scenes coming together to then go and create, okay, these are the actions. So maybe that's about the reverse engineering as well. What are the visuals that we're seeing? And then link the actions back to that. Yeah, so there is a phenomenon, I would mention the Iranian cinema and one of my favorites is Abbas Kiarostami. And there was a book about uh, when he would teach people how to make short films. Mm. And it's a really good read. It, it, it's a, I mean, it absolutely changed my life. And in it, there was this woman who is talking to him about, oh, she's like, I want to make a film about a woman who's afraid of elevators. Because the assignment was you had to use an elevator, you had to use a lift in, in this, the film. So everyone's got their ideas. And she goes, yeah, I want to make a movie about this woman who's afraid of elevators. And he goes, how do we know she's afraid of elevators? Does she wear like a, like a badge, like a medical badge? This is, I'm scared of elevators. And she's like, no, no, no. Uh, there's a doorman who usually lets her up and he's not there today. He's like, how do we know that he's not there today? Like, how do you show someone's mm -hmm. absence? Like, and it's because she keeps saying like the thing of, it's about a guy who thinks blah, 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 or a woman who thinks blah, blah you can't show that. So like the, the, the power of that, and this is, I mean, I ran workshops with filmmakers who like, they, they produce big stuff and they still talk like that. It's hard to get them to train to speak that way. But once you get that down, um, you're, you're golden. Mo your stories will transform overnight by speaking. Because again, you're not telling them what the implication is. You're not, you're not being deductive. You're, you're being inductive. You're saying like, this is what happened. And then this is the outcome. And then they're like, oh, they must be related somehow. Yeah. And it, even bad movies get away with this because <laughs> they don't need to be that explicit. Your brain will be like, I'm not sure what that was about. I think it was this. Mm. And that's, that's what the brain's good at. It's good at connecting the dots. Yeah. That's interesting. So it, it's interesting that, as well. I find with movies where obviously a director, script writer, well, I don't know the proper roles, but they've got this vision of the story and then an editor comes up and picks it up and they edit key parts where we do have to go, oh, I think they meant to link it this way, but unfortunately that's been lost in the filmmaking process. Um, and I just say like, as a, a learning designer, that's about testing your work and go through it yourself and see, can you do the solution and are you confused at any point? That's one of the kind of user testing questions we ask. Um, were you confused at any point or ask someone else to do it and ask, figure out, uh, is there a gap? Because we get so consumed by our work that we, we remember, oh, that was our intent or we meant that to happen. It hasn't ended up in the end, the end product, but then that's actually something that's difficult for someone to make the link on. And that message that we intended could be lost and the learning objective not met. Yeah. I mean, it, and it's not to say like, I think that the people talk about designing as though it's for like a third to fourth grade level or something, or um, that people aren't that bright. And it's like, it's, it's not that like, they're not paying attention. Their attention's not there. So their faculties are, are reduced. I mean, mm. really smart people. They're not going to do the work, it's physically straining to do this. And it's physically straining to, to, to computate 
certain problems. And asking somebody to do that on the fly is like asking them to deadlift, you know, something well outside their weight class. They're just like, I, I'm not ready for that. And like, I'm eating lunch right now. I don't want to go, you know, clean and jerk this thing. Yeah. Um, but I think that part of it is um, in knowing that, like, if you can kind of reduce that and is there any, is there any possibility for confusion? Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that having a solid framework helps you engineer ways around that where you can quickly see, like, I mean, the, for me, the matrix was very obvious when I had it on a grid, I was like, oh, cool. Um, I know that it, uh, this might break it. And, and what do I want to do differently for that? And I can quickly see it and solve it at that point. But um, yeah, going through, it's really great. And then if you have somebody that can dummy test it to watch them interact with it, mm. I had a, a, my personal website, I had a friend look at it and I watched him use it and he was clicking on the, the logo icon yeah. that there's just like, it returns home. He just kept clicking it. It went on for like a good minute and a half and I'm watching, <laughs> I didn't say anything. And finally I was just like, what are you hoping happens? Like, as you keep clicking this and he goes, I don't know, it just looks important. And this is like a, you know, this mid fifties man who's like successful. He runs a tech company. He runs a tech company. And he's like, I don't, I mean, it was such a weird thing to be like, you know, tech services. So it's like enterprise services. And I'm like, I don't, I don't <laughs> understand why he's doing this, but, but it, you, I'm never surprised what people are just like get hung up on. I mean, mm -hmm. for the longest time, you know, I mean, you know, as a you know, UI UX designer, people struggle with this. Like, how do you, how do people know your website's a one pager? Do they just naturally scroll? A lot of people do, but there's a large percentage that don't. This gets into more other, like other aspects like accessibility. You know, like you, when you're thinking about designing your content, where would someone be confused if they only heard this, if they couldn't see it very well? And that's why your sound design, like when I, so my actual filmmaking process goes, I try to tell the story visually as much as I can, because again, it's the action, but I can, I can intimate what the action is by sound. I don't have to just have it be visuals, right? Like there's all these different effects, you know, horn honking, a saw buzzing, like there are things that, that put people in a space. Mm. And, and, but I, I have to go through and listen to it as though I'm not watching it to make sure that that picture aligns. And then you have the opportunity to subvert those expectations too. Um, yeah. It's like in film school, they tell you like, imagine a car crash, what could you, what noises could you play that wouldn't be breaking glass and crumpling metal? Because it's so overused, sound designers are like, how could I make this more interesting for somebody? And that's why you'll see like slow motion with violin music or someone singing, like that's, that's another way that they're trying to do it. Yeah. And that becomes trite and so on and on and on and on, but. That's a good test. And I am actually thinking back to the video you showed at the beginning. It, I could see if there was no audio, I'd still be emotionally connected and curious. And if I had no visual and I only had audio, the same thing would happen for me. So well played. I'll yeah, be more and that's observant not, of that. <laughs> that whole audio has been engineered. None of that exists, even the running. Yeah, so wow. it's all like fully and been modified. So it sounds like it's in the space. That's cool. um, yeah. Very cool. Okay. Third takeaway. So we've had simplify the complex, focus on actions and images. And the last one is to be curious and seek to understand. Um, we don't have to have all the answers. We can go get them from the people that have them. And when we do that and co-create the solution with the client, we that's where behavior change is more likely to happen because we create a solution that is fit for purpose and solves the true problem. And I think you do that really well in your guided clarity session by the sounds of it. So, yeah. Yeah, I try to. And I, I mean, I'm always curious, like what instructional designers, I mean, my, my assumption is that they got into the field because they also share a love of learning, you know, and, and do they feel stagnant at any point or can they help rekindle that feeling or that value? Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah. I feel like, this is just a taster of all the like knowledge and like value that you have to bring Richard. Uh, so thank you for what you have shared today for the people that this has resonated with, watch it in on repeat and over time, because there's, you're going to hear lots of things, many ways and want to experiment as well, but check out the link in the description. You can check out Sage media and the Sage Academy where Richard's got a storytelling course, but thank you for, just opening this can of worms for me personally. I, I have a, a lot I'm like processing at the moment, but I do feel I definitely like have this 
there's an emotion in me where I'm compelled to now go create in what you've inspired. So thank you for that. And also okay. thank you for validating some of the things that we are experimenting with ourselves as well, because what we're doing, um, you know, you've come from a real film perspective. Yeah. And I just love making the links between transferable industries. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for sharing today. Well, and I just wanted to offer too, like, I recognize that like my language sometimes seems a bit of that kind of circuitous, or it may not be as clear as an instructional designer would present the information. And that, that's not in the course, but I, I recognize that like being a filmmaker does kind of put me in a disadvantage to talking um, to you guys about this stuff. And, and I, so I appreciate you mentioning the, the rewatching in that it is roundabout, but like, <laughs> It, there's something there <laughs> like <laughs> no, you know it, not to feel overwhelmed by it or feel like it's confusing but yeah. no it's all very clear I think you're very objective and intentional and there's a lot of practical things that people can apply so that's great I, I'm yeah glad to hear that. yeah a lot awesome. of value so thank you you're welcome and thanks everyone for watching peace out until the next episode what's up awesome human thank you thank you thank you on behalf of myself and the Bell Vista Studios team for continuously choosing to learn with us. We really appreciate it. If the tips and the insights and the context resonate with you and you want to take your skills to the next level or you want to make your life way easier, you will love our Creator Hub. The Creator Hub is a place for people like you and us. Basically, it's the stuff that we use internally at Bell Vista Studios and then we just share it publicly with you. The Creator Hub is created by instructional designers for instructional designers. And what you'll love there at the moment is we've got a quiz, could I be a better instructional designer? That has so much tips in the feedback if you're interested in human-centered design or just taking your skills to the next level in terms of the solutions you're creating and the problems you want to solve. But in there as well, aren't we cute? That's us. Um, but we've got the coaching courses, freebies, give us gratitude, and also we've got some templates. And basically they're always around the lens of learning experience design, instructional design, and e-learning. So a human-centered design focus is very much what we're about at Bell Vista Studio. So putting your learners at the heart of a solution and creating something for their needs. So there's the human-centered design stuff and then we've also got the business stuff. So this is the stuff they don't teach you about when you want to become a freelancer or a consultant in the instructional design world. So go check it out. The link is in the description. You can check out everything that is available for you. Thank you for choosing to learn with us. Continuously invest in your skills. You will be rewarded as an instructional designer. Share this stuff, share it with other people because when we are better instructional designers, we create better solutions that create better humans, that create a better world. So we have a very important role and I'm excited to be on this journey with you. Have an awesome day.